Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. To get into the SR-71 program, you have to want to go uh, into it. So it's a volunteer program only. Uh, you send a package of uh, all your flying records, your recommendations, uh, all your efficiency of reports. All those are sent to Beale Air Force Base. And your package sits there until the people at Beale determine they have a need for another crew. And once they do that, they sit around a table they look at all these folders from the applicants and they pass them around a table and everyone sort of talks about each applicant and they give it a yes or no and if you get basically a yes from everybody then you're invited out to Beal for a one week of interview and during that one week uh, you come out you interview with the wing commander the do the squadron commander all these people that have a vested interest in hiring you into the program and if you pass the interviews then you move on to the next stage is basically you're flying you get two check flights in the t-38 and you get a basic check flight in the sr-71 simulator at beale uh, then the third major hurdle is at the end of that week is you to go down to travis air force base and take a a physical. It's a fairly demanding physical. It's not as it's not as demanding as an astronaut physical, but it's a little bit more involved than a, a basic Air Force pilot physical. So if you pass all the interviews, you pass your flying, and you pass your physical, after the end of the week you go back to where you came from. And for me that was back to Okinawa. That's where I was flying the F-4. And uh, about two, two and a half months later I got a letter of acceptance into the program. And that's what happens. After they filter out and they have a need for another crew, you get invited out to Beale to start your training. And I started in uh, June of 1974. And that's where I met up with my backseater, Don Emmons, who is you're now mated. He came out from uh, flying B-52s, and we meet for the very first time at Beale. And that's where we start training as a crew together. You always fly in the SR-71 as a form crew. Uh, we never mix and match crews on operational sorties. So if we were flying an operational sortie out of Mildenhall or Okinawa and one of you are sick for the day or you know sprain your ankle, you're both grounded and we bring in a backup crew to fly the mission. So that was very important. You fly as a mixed, as a form crew the entire time because you know each other very intimately and you know each other. If you were just to say something in a cockpit like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what Don's talking about, but oh my gosh, and somebody else, that could mean another thing. So, The crew member you form up with, in my case it was Don Emmons, uh, you go everywhere together. Uh, the wives often said that uh, we knew each other better, we knew our own wives, because we were spending more time. And yes, our program, uh, you're not home very often, so you're gone a lot. And uh, because of that, I was with Don Emmons a lot of the time. and. Uh, you know, we, we flew together, we did everything together as a crew. Uh, if we had the backup crew for the day, we were what we call the mobile crew. So you stay together the entire time, uh, and you get to know each other quite well. The training for the SR-71 is all at Beale Air Force Base in Northern California, and the training lasts roughly nine months long. Uh, during that nine months, uh, your goal as a student pilot is to gather 100 hours. Now, once you get 100 hours in the SR, you're then allowed to go fly the operational missions, uh, first over Okinawa, and then secondly over at uh, RAF Mildenhall in England. We had one simulator. It was a very good simulator, and we relied on it a lot. Uh, since the, the airplane, the SR-71, is very, very expensive to fly, uh, we did a lot of training in the simulator. Uh, as you go through your training program, uh, we try, if you're going to uh, 
uh, probably fail or wash out of the program. Uh, we tried to do it in a simulator before the crew member got to the actual airplane, uh, obviously for a cost reduction. But uh, the simulator was very, very uh, uh, dynamic. It, uh, it was a program where uh, we learned things and practiced things that you just can't do in the airplane, you know, yeah. like engine out procedures or getting automatic unstarts and restarts. These things were practiced day in and day out in the simulator before you got into the airplane. Yeah, after you do all your 12 simulator missions, <clears throat> that's when you put your first footstep in the airplane. And I was very uh, uh, lucky I passed all the, the, the simulator missions. And on the 12th, on the, the first time I put my foot in the airplane and they close the canopy down, you feel a lot better because now all of a sudden with all the simulator training behind you, you had no windows to look out of. Well, now I got a window, so it was very, very uh, comforting to get in the airplane and fly it for the first time uh, with the instructor in the back seat of the trainer model. Uh, you're so well trained that you feel right at home for your very first mission. There's no, there's nothing new coming up other than the fact you can now see outside. That was probably the strangest feeling of being able to see outside. Uh, found it quite comfortable. You get five dual missions. And generally, that's it. If you can't do it within five missions, uh, very reluctantly, it would give maybe a sixth one or another extra mission somewhere. But it's so expensive to fly this airplane that uh, if you couldn't make it after five, uh, you were probably going to go back to where you came from. And there's no stigma with our program. Most of the crew members went right back to where they came from and continued to fly uh, in the Air Force. Uh, if you don't pass a school, a formal Air Force school, like getting the F-4s or getting the F-15s or F-16s, if you don't pass that school, then you meet probably what's going to be called a FEB, a Flying Evaluation Board. Well, for our program, for the SR, it's so unique and so different from all the others. We were never part of the Air Force's school of uh, uh, training. We maintained our own in-house training. So if you didn't cut the mustard in the SR, uh, you wouldn't lose your wings and you wouldn't meet an FEB. Uh, you'd go onto another aircraft. So, you know, Once you came off the tanker with a full load of gas, which is 80,000 pounds, uh, you would then light the burners, uh, the afterburners, all the way into maximum AB. And the airplane, we did what was called a dipsy doodle, where we'd climb it up super subsonic and then just push it over and get through the sound barrier as soon as we could. There's a high drag region from about 0.98 to Mach 1.03. So you wanna get through that region as fast as you can. So we do this dipsy doodle and go through it. Once you went through the sound barrier, then we start a climb up. And we maintain a, a constant airspeed climb, basically at uh, 450 knots equivalent airspeed, K-E-A-S we called it. And as you hold this constant airspeed on the way up, the Mach would accelerate to Mach 1, 1 1.5, Mach 2, 2.5, then you'd be leveling off at Mach 3 at about 70,000, 71,000 feet. Uh, flying the SR at Mach 3, uh, you have to be very light on the controls. And that's why, now you can hand fly the airplane the entire time, uh, but you're going to degrade the imagery probably because of a little bit of a porpoising action when you're hand flying it. Very hardly even noticeable. But if you're sensors, you need a nice stable platform. And that's why you fly it through the autopilot with these little wheels that take out any kind of a pitch moment. They make it nice and stable. The one unique thing with the SR that I don't think any other airplane I know of uses is a uh, liquid chemical ignition system. And for the SR, uh, because of the high flash point of our fuel, which was JP7, a one-of-a-kind fuel, no other airplane uses that I know of. Uh, I've seen crew chiefs throw cigarette butts and matches into this JP-7 and it just drowns out. So it's a very high flash point fuel. Well, to ignite this high flash, high flash point fuel, Kelly Johnson and his band of engineers had to come up with a unique way of igniting it. And it was with a liquid chemical called triethylborane, T-E-B, that's why we called it TEB for short. So this triethylborane is a liquid chemical that if I had it in a squirt gun right here and I squirted it into this room, it explodes on contact with the atmosphere. And that became our ignition source to light off the fuel. So when we started the engines up, it would spray this metered amount of TEB, this liquid chemical, into the 
uh, combustion chamber would explode and that would light off our fuel. When we put the throttles up into afterburner, the same thing happened back there. This meter amount of TEB would be sprayed into the fuel, go kaboom, and that in turn would light off the afterburner.